In the last 200 years, life in Europe has been completely transformed. From an almost exclusively village-based farming society, it has become an industrial society. This was a revolution not born of politicians and princes, but driven by a group of faceless entrepreneurs whose enterprise and ambition pushed Europe, for better or worse, into the industrial age. The iron the revolution needed was part of the Earth's original structure. But the coal that fired all this was created from geological upheavals 400 million years ago. Records of those upheavals can still be seen in Europe's rocks which buckled and contorted in a great collision of drifting land masses, the slow but relentless geological pile-up that resulted in the creation of Europe itself. To see how it happened, we can reverse the map of this part of the planet by 200 million years and watch Europe's familiar outline vanish. This was Europe 500 million years ago. Running forward once more, the ancient continents start on their collision course. The force of that collision was so great that as they drove into each other, the land surface was folded up into great mountain ranges. Most of these mountains were once the size of Everest, and even after 200 million years of wear by water and ice, they are still impressive. Northern Spain's Picos de Europa still rise above the clouds to heights of nearly two miles. In their deep valleys, they held warm swamps and, by chance, in a future unimaginably distant, these swamps would provide the substance of a social metamorphosis. Forty-five million years, the swamps stewed. Plants and animals died and rotted, and in a constant simmering cycle, gave nourishment to new plants and animals. It was a world in which life had different dimensions. Along with the huge amphibians lived giant insects, monstrous cockroaches and carnivorous dragonflies with enormous wings. Heavily armored millipedes grew over two yards long. There were forests of ferns and mosses the size of oaks. 
As the plants died and sank down to the swamp bed, vast amounts of organic debris piled up. This peaty debris from the ancient carboniferous swamps would eventually turn into coal. This is the origin of all the coal deposits in modern day Europe. To make coal, the peat was buried under tons of silt and compressed further and further. The compression was so intense, so unrelenting, that one yard of coal represents 20 yards of swamp. As the continents continued to shove and heave and rise and crack, some of the coal was pushed toward the surface and, like anything at the surface, was lost to erosion. But a lot of it, a huge amount, is still stored in underground seams. In Europe alone, about 4.3 million tons of coal are hacked out of the earth each day. Yet there is still enough left to last at the present rate of burning for over 200 years. This staggering consumption reflects coal's crucial position in today's European industry. Yet, 700 years ago, it was hardly considered a resource. Coal, or sea coal, was first traded in a small way back in the 13th century as the poor man's substitute for wood. One reason it hadn't been used before, exposed as it was on beaches and in river cuttings, was that this sea coal made filthy smoke. Laws were passed against burning it in towns, and medieval opinions against air pollution were definite. In 1306, one coal user was hung, drawn, and quartered for fouling the common air supply. As time passed, coal became increasingly valuable and was pursued beyond the beach and into the earth. It was mined, and by the middle of the 16th century, a German writer, Agricola, considered it worthwhile to publish a manual for diggers of coal and other minerals. Carry it in this way, he said, trucks rolling on wooden planks held in place by pegs, precursors of railways. By 1600, about 50,000 tons a year were being brought to the surface. Its main use was still domestic, as a substitute for wood, though it was increasingly used by industry for producing lime, for glass making, for brewing and dyeing. As they delved deeper underground, the early miners came up against another serious problem, flooding. But here, Agricola was particularly ingenious, suggesting a wide range of pumps and rotating sponges and chains of buckets to get the water up to the surface. These pumps needed a source of energy to drive them and Agricola recommends manpower, horsepower, even goat power to keep your mind dry. But in terms of Europe's total energy requirement, 50,000 tons of coal contributed about as much proportionately as wind power does today. Wood was still the fuel. And the reason there was still wood to burn was that for many centuries, the woodlands had been carefully managed so that natural growth could keep pace with demand. 
Many large European forests owe their existence today to their careful management by local industries hundreds of years ago. Paradoxically, industry was a great force for preservation. Wood was needed for both building and burning, for burning raw and burning as charcoal for use in the making of iron. Charcoal provided heat for both the iron masters who smelted iron from its ore and the iron smiths who made it into useful objects, mainly farm tools at this stage. Charcoal provided the heat, but water provided the power for early industry. Driving cutters, spinners, grinders, fans, pounders of all descriptions and uses. But water couldn't provide heat. And the only source of clean, intense heat the ironsmiths had was charcoal. Coal had been tried as a source of heat, but it was useless. Its impurities would contaminate the iron and make it brittle and difficult to work. By the start of the 18th century, the ironsmiths had to live with a chronic fuel shortage. The forests which had provided wood to be made into charcoal were in danger of over-exploitation. Another supply of high-energy fuel for industry had to be found. Lying in an unmarked grave in a tiny burial plot in the center of England is the body of the man who solved the problem. His name was Abraham Darby, and he joined together the emerging iron and coal industries for the first time, making possible the Industrial Age. Darby knew that many iron masters and ironsmiths had tried to use coal and failed. But in 1709, he began to use a special sort of coal. If coal was carefully heated without allowing it to catch fire, the impurities could be driven off as gases, leaving an almost pure source of carbon. This pure form of coal is called coke. The use of coke opened up, as if by magic, a vast new store of energy to the iron industry a whole epoch's worth of unburnt plant life. Ironsmiths used coke to work iron, and iron masters used it to extract it from its ore in the first place. Barrow loads of coke and iron ore were fed into furnaces. Water wheels drove great bellows which blasted the fire with oxygen and raised the heat so high that iron would tamely ooze out of its ore and gather in pools at the bottom of the furnace. Then the furnace would be tapped and the iron poured out to cool in molds. Because the molds looked a little like piglets suckling a sow, the iron became known as pig iron. <laughs> 
With its new, apparently unlimited supply of fuel, the 18th century iron industry was free to expand. The principle of smelting iron ore with coke, developed by Abraham Darby in 1709, underlies the whole of Europe's iron industry today. Darby's 18th century furnace produced just 300 tons of iron per year. This one produces that amount every two hours. And in a year, well over a million tons. All this because of one man's simple idea, the resulting marriage of emerging industries, and what's known as a quantum leap, the rare, almost miraculous occasion when one and one make much, much more than two. Coal as a fuel source did present some problems. Flooding, for example. As the miners dug deeper, the flooding got worse far beyond remedy by any of Agricola's prescriptions. Come on. Come. In 1711, Thomas Newcomen, an ironmonger from Devon, created, for the specific purpose of pumping out flooded mines, the first steam machine. This was a new departure for coal. Until now, coal burned and produced heat. Now it burned and produced heat, which produced steam, which produced motion. The steam was raised in a boiler underneath the actual engine. The whole machine was controlled by a complex system of valves. These periodically opened and shut, injecting steam into the cylinder, causing the piston to go up and down. The piston was connected to one end of the beam. And the other end drove the pumps down in the mine drawing the water up to the surface. Although it looks primitive to us, in 1711, these coal-powered Newcomen engines with a cutting edge of high technology. It wasn't long before the sound of the clanking Newcomen could be heard all over Europe. It was 1760. The foundation for the Industrial Revolution was set, but that was all. As cylinders for the Newcomen engines were carted to another mine, the country they crossed was still strictly agricultural. The whole of this country, a German said of England in 1761, is not unlike a well-kept garden. There was, in fact, another revolution underway, an agricultural one. A new understanding of selective breeding had doubled the weight of cattle and sheep, and the enclosure system vastly increased yields. The private concentrated agricultural wealth was now pumped into the emerging industries. But all the new machines had one factor in common. They needed a source of power, and this was it. The Watt rotating steam engine. Newcomen's pumping engine had been the first to transform heat into motion, 
But the engine designed by the Scottish engineer James Watt was much more sophisticated and powerful. Instead of simply going up and down, it went round and round, making it capable, by a system of belts, of driving all sorts of industrial machinery. In 1790, for the first time, a Watt engine was installed in a weaving factory. And from that point on, Britain led the world in industrial production. The wonder of steam engines was that they could work anywhere. You could put your factory wherever you wanted it, near raw materials, near markets, near labor. The world belonged to the European industrialists. Productivity was up. Profits were up. All that was keeping them from making twice as much was the unfortunate phenomenon of nightfall. But after 1802, even that stopped being a problem. Another British engineer, Murdoch, had had the brilliant idea of using the gas driven off coal during the coking process as a source of lighting. Almost as soon as they had heard of the idea, European entrepreneurs realized that the gas lighting could indeed keep their factories going all night. John Cockerell was one of the first to lay in piping. Lighting was much better news for the owners than it was for the workers. By now, all the social ills commonly associated with the early Industrial Revolution were well in place. Though it was theoretically possible to put factories anywhere, the overwhelming tendency was to put them in towns. There was a great migration from the land to the cities, to the slums. The profit motive had overridden humanity. And all hands were needed at the coal face. Children as young as five were down there, making sixpence a day. Their mothers made two shillings, carrying the full sacks up vertical shafts. In 1841, the French prohibited children between 8 and 12 from working more than 8 hours a day. It was all right, though, for 12 to 16-year-olds to work the full 12 hours. Coal was now the basis of three important industries. Iron, steam-driven manufacturing, and gas lighting. It was overloading the transport network. The canal system coped until the rise of Napoleon in France made war imminent and the British army requisitioned the barge horses. In some areas, the canals lost their source of power and lay idle. But industry desperately needed cheap transport to move heavy coal and iron. 
The mother of invention was there, and so soon was the invention. In 1804, the year before the Battle of Trafalgar, Richard Trevithick, a Cornish engineer, imagined another way of transmitting heat to steam, to motion, and produced the first viable locomotive for a Welsh ironworks. Trevithick-type locomotives worked in various collieries for the next decade, but Trevithick's inventive genius was not coupled with a great business sense. It would be left to another engineer, George Stevenson, to really put steam locomotives on the rails. In 1825, on the 27th of September, before a crowd of tens of thousands, Stevenson's locomotion made its first run. The train it pulled weighed 90 tons and was 400 feet long. It arrived at Stockton K. To the cheers of 40,000 people, a salute by seven cannons, two bands playing God Save the King, and a chorus of church bells. The railways had arrived. Driven by the railways, industrialization stretched even further across Europe, fanning out like a miasma from every coal field. Coal had become the universal power source. It was used everywhere. Smelting iron, making steam, making motion, hauling itself all over the continent. The coal was bulky and heavy. What was really needed was a way to transform it into another sort of energy altogether. One with no weight and no bulk. In a word, electricity. In 1867, Werner von Siemens perfected the dynamo and created a whole new industry. Von Siemens dynamos were used in the world's first commercial electricity generating power station in 1882. Now, power could be delivered anywhere at the end of a simple cable. Gas lamps were replaced by electric street lights. But to develop beyond a scientific curiosity into a commercial industry, electricity had to be taken off the streets and sold into the home. Lighting was the first obvious domestic use for electricity in the form of the new filament lamps. Electrical balloon heaters seem almost otherworldly now, but they worked. There were cigar lighters. and gadgets that produced what the makers claimed was therapeutic electrical massage. There were electric kettles that plugged straight into light sockets. Then, as you got into bed, pre-warmed with an electric blanket, 
You could let electricity carry on working for you in the form of the ruthlessly efficient electrical mouse trap. Germany was at the forefront of the electrical industry, and yet it had been born with an industrial handicap. Its coal and iron reserves were widely separated. The arrival of the railways suddenly solved that problem, linking them together. By 1871, Germany was the world's second biggest coal producer and was soon chasing Britain as the world's number one industrial nation. Its specialty was steel. Steel is refined iron, iron with its native impurities removed. Steel, for all practical purposes, is almost pure iron with a few carefully controlled additives. And the principles of purification that the Germans were using at the end of the 19th century are no different from the ones that are used today. First, the impure or molten iron from the blast furnace is poured into a converter over 200 tons at a time. Then a water-cooled lance is dropped like a giant swizzle stick into the molten iron. Next, pure oxygen is bubbled through the lance and into the iron. As the oxygen bubbles back up, it combines with the impurities, turning them into slag and gases, which are driven off. is sampled and once the impurities have fallen to the right levels the metal is poured out of the converter the molten metal now transformed from iron to steel is cast into 10-ton slabs. As the slabs are cooled, they are squeezed between huge rollers and flattened to many times their original length. The sheets, finally, are rolled out and wound into gigantic coils. When they are unwound again, these coils of steel will be turned into typewriters and toasters, cars and trailers, microwaves and washing machines, all the paraphernalia of modern life. But back in 19th century Germany, not all of those things had been invented yet. <laughs> 
What had been invented, the kind of products that in human history have always been among the first to emerge from a new technology, were weapons. Modern weapons. Europe's leading purveyor of these was Alfred Krupp, whose factory this was. The competition among Europe's nations for economic and manufacturing advantage had easily boiled over into an arms race, which Krupp and others were happy to accommodate. With the enthusiastic support of the Kaiser, Krupp showed off his latest steel weaponry to representatives of all European nations who eagerly bought the latest offerings. All of Europe was now swept by industrialization, even the backward giant Russia. Russia suddenly had factories and peasant serfs were about to be coerced into an industrial workforce. The pattern was the same. Railway lines linked iron reserves to coal reserves with iron works at either end. To the peasants, it was like being propelled 800 years into the future. A not very nice future. They even had to be taught how coal was supposed to be mined. The social consequences of the time warp were crushing. But the Russians did have an abundance of the Industrial Revolution's twin supports, iron and coal. At the end of the 19th century, as industrialization gathered pace, Karl Marx wrote that in Russia, all the horrors of the early days of the British factory system are still in full bloom. <laughs> Nevertheless, these exhausted Russian peasants drove the Industrial Revolution forward. Drove it so hard that by 1914, the growth of the Russian industry matched that of the Germans, and the Germans became nervous. Tensions between European nations reached a crescendo. The First World War was truly a war of steel. Every yard of the disputed front had to be supplied with tons of munitions. The human creativity and ingenuity that had been the driving force of the Industrial Revolution was no longer used for the benefit of mankind, but its destruction. This war for European supremacy pitted the industrial might of nation against nation, factory against factory. The technical challenge now was to create ever more effective weapons of death. been the power behind the whole industrial revolution but the same upheavals that had created coal created another resource over a million times more powerful a force for good or for evil uranium 
During the formation of the mountains that had created the coal swamps, the plates of the Earth's crust had become molten. As the molten rock cooled, uranium ores were concentrated together. The same geological processes which had been responsible for producing coal also created concentrations of uranium, which are scattered throughout present-day Europe. The uranium was in solution in water and under enormous pressure. It was either deposited at surface vents or left behind in the same vents deep underground. It was first identified in 1789 by a German pharmacist. He got ores from a mine in Czechoslovakia and after a long struggle refined a previously unknown metallic element, calling it uranium after the recently discovered planet Uranus. By the 19th century, uranium was being mined commercially. It was used to make steels, and almost unbelievably, as a medical cure-all for eczema, ringworm, spots, and headaches. But its main use was to color glass, producing some beautiful effects. From iridescent greens and velvety black to lemon yellow and salmon pink. Queen Victoria herself was presented with a set of uranium colored glass. Today, because they are radioactive, these lovely pieces would be classified as nuclear waste. But the full implications of the term radioactivity surfaced very slowly. Early researchers were intrigued when they held uranium near photosensitive screens and saw flashes of light. They realized that the atoms in uranium were unstable, constantly flying apart and showering the near neighborhood with invisible, high-energy particles. The first attempt to harness this energy was in 1942 in America in an experimental nuclear reactor built on a squash court at the University of Chicago. As control rods were eased out of the pile of 56 tons of uranium and the reaction began, students sat on top with buckets of chemicals to pour onto it if anything went wrong. December 2nd, 1942, the first ever man-made nuclear chain reaction was underway. For better or worse, the immense potential energy of uranium was under the all-too-fallible control of man. Next time on The Birth of Europe, we'll see how industrial power was fueled by petroleum. From the first oil lamps to the German Blitzkrieg, Oil was to become the precious commodity Europe could not do without. Monday on David L. Wolper Presents, American and Russian scientists map out their strategies on the race for space. And Wednesday, 
Battleships enter the nuclear age, commanding the seas as missile carriers and launchers on America at War. Thank you.